Hello and welcome. Wish you all a very happy Bears Day. And on the, on the occasion of International Bear Day, Happy Bear Day, uh, on behalf of Wildlife and Conservation Biology Research Lab and our partners, Forest Department Gujarat, Corbett Foundation, Century Asia Foundation, and IUCN Bear Specialist Group, I welcome one and all over here in the online lecture series, live lecture series on the bears of India. Friends, you all know that India is holding four species of bears, and that's why first time ever in India, we are organizing a expert talk series on the bears of India. All the experts who are giving his talk on this occasion for these coming four days are the member of IUCN Bear Specialist Group. And for that, I'm very much thankful to IUCN Bear Specialist Group for providing this platform to talk about the bears of India. On very first day, we have here Dr. Dev Garshalish. Dev is a co-chair of IUCN Bear Specialist Group. And Dev, he's the person, he's the man who has worked on seven species out of eight bear species of the world. So we are very fortunate here to have Dev Garshalish to talk about the bears of the world. And after, bear, after Dev, we have another talk from my co-chair of Slaughter Expert Team, Dr. Harendra Singh Bhargal. So I welcome both of you, Dev and Haren, for your talk. Now I welcome Dev and I request Dev to start his talk. Dev, please. All right, can I just start? Yeah, okay. All right, let's do it. All right, the bears of the world. I'm going to talk about is conservation making a difference? My name is Dave Garcellis, and I'm co chair of the IUCN Bear Specialist Group. The IUCN is the largest, most effective conservation organization in the world, and the Bear Specialist Group is one small part of that. Our mission is to promote the conservation of bears living in their natural habitats across their worldwide distribution. Well, there's bears in the sky. There's a major or the familiar Big Dipper. There's lots of cartoon bears. But our interest is the eight living species of bears. These are the brown bear, the American black bear, polar bear, Andean bear. And then there's four species that are endemic to Asia, meaning that they only live in Asia. The Asiatic black bear, the sloth bear, sun bear, and the giant panda. Six of these species, or 75%, are threatened globally. They're on the IUCN red list as vulnerable, which is just below the endangered category. And the Bear Specialist Group is in charge of making these assessments every 10 years or so. We're also in charge of trying to reduce the threats and to try to get them off of this vulnerable category and make them less threatened. So let's take a look at these species. This is the brown bear, also the grizzly bear, versus Arctos. The species was actually named by Carl Linnaeus. He was the guy that invented the system of having a genus and a species way back in 1958. He named this the genus bear in Latin. Ursus means bear. And in Greek, the species Arctos means bear. So this is the bear bear. This is the only bear that Linnaeus knew. Linnaeus lived in southern Sweden. And in Europe, there's only the brown bear. You can see that even in Linnaeus's time, it was wiped out in much of Europe. The pink here is extinct more than 500 years ago, but they were strong in Scandinavia. Today, there's 10 brown bear populations in Europe. They're all increasing, although four of them are still called critically, critically endangered. Two of the populations in Spain, two of the populations in Italy. Let's just take a look at one of those, this one right here in the Northern Alps. 
This was down to three or four bears left by the mid 1990s. There were 10 bears reintroduced in the late 90s, early 2000s, and now the population is doing very well at about 70 bears. So this species, the brown bear, also lives in North America. You can see that a large part of Western United States is also extinct, but there's a remnant population in Yellowstone National Park. There's some small remnant populations in Southern Canada, but very strong populations in Western Canada, into Alaska. And this population is actually expanding now into the Arctic with climate change. And the brown bear also lives in Asia. In fact, its strongest populations are in Asia with about 100,000 bears or more in Russia. And they look quite different in different parts of the range. So in the Russian Far East, we have the very biggest brown bears in the world. And we have these smaller bears, kind of colorful brown bears in the Tibetan Plateau and in Pakistan. And all these populations are actually doing quite well increasing um, in these parts of Asia. We also have brown bears in the Middle East. Brown bears were recorded in the Bible and they went extinct in, in uh, most of this area, but we're now actually seeing a few bears coming back in even Syria and Lebanon. Right, let's switch to the American black bear. Well, the American black bear, although it's called the black bear versus Americanus, also comes in brown. And in parts of Canada, sort of this rare subspecies is in white. It once covered basically the entire continent down to the central part of Mexico. It's now in pretty much that same range, although it's wiped out in a large part of the agricultural belt. You can see that it's expanding geographically. All those little blue dots on there show places where there's recent bear sightings where we haven't seen them before. They've recolonized a large part of their range. Seven states where they were once eliminated, they're now viable populations. It's increasing at about 2% per year across the continent. Actually, this is the most common carnivore, not only the most common bear, but the most common large carnivore on Earth. You can see that they're very adaptable. They live in little uh, river bottoms like this, these very small patches of habitat. Places where there weren't bears at one time because it was prairie are now cornfields and bears love cornfields. This is all corn damage done by bears. This is viewed from a drone. They have very high reproduction, commonly litter sizes of three, even four sometimes even five. They have a high tolerance for humans and humans have a high tolerance for these bears because they're not very aggressive. You see how casual they are in somebody's yard like this. This is not uncommon in the United States. Here they are just sort of munching on some sunflowers near a house. They're very adaptable denning habits. They can den anywhere. This is wide out in the open underground and some cattails, even with some snow on their back. And this species is actually hunted throughout most of its range, legally hunted, but the hunt is carefully managed. There's lots of research going on on this species, lots of funding for research for this species, in part because it is hunted. All right, this species, the polar bear, versus Maritimus, the bear of the Maritimes, the sea bear. So this bear only occurs in the Arctic region. And of course, Arctic means the land of the bear. These are the high density areas, the light is the low density areas. Where there's really thick ice around the North Pole, there's low density of polar bears. The thing is the polar bears need ice. They need it as a platform to hunt seals. They can't hunt seals out in the water. They can't catch a seal that way. So they have to wait for a seal to come up on the ice and that's when a polar bear can get them. And this is really its only food. It's shrinking, there's less habitat for the polar bears and so therefore the populations decline. This is a former 
extent of the ice. This is the current extent of the ice. And you see pictures like this of polar bears stranded on the ice. It is a little bit deceiving because polar bears actually can live on land for a while. When they're on the land, they don't eat. They can actually fast for three or four months. But then they eventually need the ice to come back for food. And that's the issue with climate change is that the ice is disappearing. It'll eventually get to a point where the polar bears can't live there anymore. The interesting thing is that although polar bears are very closely related to brown bears, brown bears are very good at catching fish, polar bears are terrible at catching fish and so they do, they can't really live during the summertime on the land with just fish. But there's lots of research going on on polar bears, lots of money spent on aerial surveys, counting bears, lots of research articles on bears. And this species is actually the beacon for climate change around the world. So let's switch now to the opposite kind of bears, the tropical bears. There's four species of tropical bears. What we mean by tropical bears is the bears that live in the tropics. In other words, between 23 degrees north and 23 degrees south of the equator. So we have the Andean bear, which leaves lives fully in the tropical region. The sun bear, which leaves, lives mostly in the tropical region. The sloth bear, which is about two thirds in the tropical region. And the Asiatic black bear, which is about half in the tropical region. So this is the Andean bear. It was once called the spectacle bear because of that white around its eyes, kind of spectacles. It lives in probably five countries, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia. It might dribble into Argentina. There's a little bit of controversy about whether they actually live in Argentina. But they live in a wide variety of habitats from um, very low dry areas to very wet, high, rugged, mountainous areas, some grasslands, some forests. But some of this habitat is disappearing. Some of it is due to climate change, some of it is due to people, and through modeling, it has been projected that there'll be a sizable loss of habitat and sizable loss of the range for this species. But people are trying to work to try to retain that good habitat for Indian bears. The other issue with this species is that they occasionally kill cattle, which doesn't make farmers too happy. Sometimes the bears are killed out of retribution for this. But there's lots of work going on for, on this species, lots of people out in the grasslands and the forest doing surveys, looking for sign of this species and mapping where they occur and trying to document whether the populations are stable, declining, or possibly even increasing. Okay, now let's go to Asia. This is the Asiatic black bear, Ursus tibetanus, bear with the Mickey Mouse ears. This was the historic range of this species going from Iran on the west, Russia in the north, Thailand in the south, and the biggest population is in China. You can see that some of this has disappeared, back to the historic current range, but it still lives in the same 18 countries. Some of the habitat has been lost. Some of it is due to farming, due to urbanization, but actually, the main central part of the range, China, has the largest net gain of forest of any country in the world. The big issue with this species is poaching, people trapping this bear. And the main thing that they're after are gallbladders. They dry the gallbladder to get the, the bile. The bile is a traditional Chinese medicine. It's been used for over 1,300 years in the Chinese pharmacopoeia, and it really is a medicine. It's actually effective for various liver ailments and eye ailments. It's not some hocus pocus thing. And so that's actually the difficult part is that it's a real medicine, but these bears are taken illegally to get this particular medicine. The medicine can be synthesized, but the synthesized product is not really used in traditional Chinese medicine. There's a lot of work going on on this species. There's a lot of survey work. Here shows some people doing interviews, some sign surveys. 
This is a major survey effort that went on in central China. There was a survey done in 2007, another one done just recently in 2019. And the good news is, is that the population appears to be increasing in this central part of China. There's also a lot of research work going on in this species. It's particularly highlighted by some research work, long-term research work by um, Dr. Meishu Wang in Taiwan. She was recently featured on the cover of National Geographic as being one of the most impactful women in the entire world. All right, now the sloth bear. This is Melursus ursinus. Mel means honey, the honey bear. You can see that this species looks a lot like the Asiatic black bear, very similar looking. Sloth bear on the right, the Asiatic black bear on the left here. The sloth bear has a, a much lighter snout. The Asiatic black bear, of course, has those Mickey Mouse ears. But these species are often confused in the wild when people see them or even in camera trapping photos. Interesting, one of the distinctive characteristics of sloth bears is this debris that's often caught on their coats. It's not the case for Asiatic black bears. Sloth bears are a species that really likes termites. They're really good diggers. They eat a lot of termites. They eat a lot of ants. They're also very aggressive. They live in a place where there's tigers. They don't climb trees very much. They have fights with tigers. And they also have fights with people when people get injured in these, in these aggressive interactions with sloth bears. The range of sloth bears has always been just the Indian subcontinent. They've never ranged further than this. Their present range is in India, Sri Lanka, Nepal. There might be a few bears that wander into Bhutan. They've gone extinct in Bangladesh recently. The interesting thing about this species is that they can live in some very scrubby habitat. They live with all these other critters like tigers and rhinos. They can live in situations like this, these very sparsely vegetated places, these boulder fields. They'll actually sleep in the boulders during the day and come out at night when it's cooler. Before they... One of the good things about um, sloth bear conservation in India is that they live in places where there's also tigers. There's been a lot of conservation directed towards tigers. So they live in these tiger reserves and they get the, the benefits of tiger protection um, by, because the, the tigers are being protected, the sloth bears are as well. Now to the sun bear. The sun bear is Elarctus malayanus. Hel means sun. This is the smallest species of bear, has very short hair, has very short ears. It lives only in Southeast Asia also lives on the Southeast Asian islands of Sumatra and Borneo. You can see that a lot of the range has been lost. They occur now in 30 percent, 30 to 40 percent of their former range. The red is the places where they're presently extinct, but they still have their biggest stronghold is in Borneo. They eat many, many kinds of fruits, hundreds of different kinds of fruits. They also eat insects. They're not quite as good an insect eater as a sloth bear, but they are pretty much second in, among the bears as being uh, having insects in their diet. One of the biggest issues for this species is the expansion of palm oil plantations, particularly in Malaysia and Indonesia. And you can see they cut the forest to produce these plantations of palm oil. And under these palm oil plantations is just no habitat for this species. So it's essentially a loss. You can see here the, the extreme deforestation that has occurred in Borneo, mainly due to the planting of palm oil. What happens when the bears lose a lot of their forest is they come into these small farms, um, eat some of the crops, destroy some of these trees, and so these people have a major loss, and then the people will, of course, try to keep the bears out and sometimes kill the bears. And in the process of doing so, a lot of cubs are captured, and these cubs end up being um, pets for people and a part of the pet trade in Southeast Asia. We just recently finished a conservation 
Action Plan for Sun Bears. This is the first global conservation action plan for any terrestrial species of bears. And there's major projects going on now um, that are directed by this plan to help the conservation of this species. Finally, last species, the giant panda, a Europoda melanoleuca. Europoda means panda foot, melanoleuca means black and white. So this species was actually named after the red panda. The red panda was named first, that's in a different family. Eventually, giant pandas became part of the bear family. For a long time, it was disputed on where they should go, but genetically, they turned out to be a bear in the family Ursidae. The reason that were, they were originally classed with the red panda is they both have this false thumb, this pseudo thumb, basically what looks like a thumb, it's not really a thumb, but it's an extra piece of bone. And that's for holding actually bamboo. This shows a bear a panda holding a carrot, but you can see that extra what looks like a thumb. And there's really, on the, on the left side of the screen there, there are five normal bear digits and this extra digit just to be able to hold bamboo. They also have very large crunching molars and that's because their entire diet is bamboo and that's all they do is eat bamboo. And so just like the polar bear is just eating seals, this species is just eating bamboo. So we have two very specialist uh, bear species. And because bamboo is available all year round, this species does not hibernate. The original range of pandas was a large part of China, even into sort of the northern part of Southeast Asia. You can see that they've pretty much disappeared from that. They're just in the very mountainous um, western part of their range. They are expanding very slowly, but they are expanding. And the populations are actually going up, which is really good news. And surveys that have been done just from uh, recently, from the year 2000 to the year 2014, population has increased about 17%. The other good news is that for a long time, there was problems breeding pandas in, the, in uh, captivity. That problem has been solved. There's been successful captive breeding of giant pandas. The, ex the extent now where there's actually too many of them in captivity, and they don't really have room for them anymore. And so what's happening now is that some of these pandas are being experimentally released into the wild in these um, reintroductions. It hasn't all been worked out yet, but eventually we think that a large number of pandas will probably be released into the wild to help the populations in the wild to grow. So with that, I hope that I've uh, convinced you that there's lots of people that are working hard to conserve bears in the wild, to understand bears better, and that bear conservation really is making headway. It really is, I think, a positive day to celebrate the advances that we've made in bear conservation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave. It was so informative and wonderful talk, as always, by you. And I'm sure our listeners have also enjoyed and learned a lot about the bears of the world. On behalf of all the partners, I would like to thank you uh, to Dave Garshalis. And on, on behalf of this day, on the occasion of this day, I would request Dave you to give a one-liner as a message on the bear, International Bear Day. So can you, Dave, can you give a one-liner? A one-liner? Yeah, your message to India for bear conservation on this okay. International okay. Bear Day celebration. Do I have to change anything here? No, it's fine, yeah. Okay. Okay, I would like to celebrate this International Bear Day with people around the world and especially the people of India. You have four of the eight species of bears in India. And I know you're doing the best that you can to take care of those bears and help uh, conserve the bears for the future for everybody in the world. Thanks very much and everybody celebrate the bears of the world today. Thank you.
Yes, I'm sure that all of us are working so hard and giving our 100% to conserve the bears of the world, to conserve the bears of the India, and all we scientists, researchers, students, and wildlife enthusiasts, we will work as a bear advocate of the world. Thank you so much, Dev. Thank you very much. Now, we have Dr. Harendra Singh Bargali. Harendra Singh Bargali is my co-chair of Slothbar Expert Team. And Harendra is the first Indian biologist who has done his PhD on the sloth bear. Harendra is currently Deputy Director of Corbett Foundation based in Ramnagar, Uttarakhand. And Harendra and I, we are working as a co-chair of the sloth bear uh, since last eight years. And uh, we have uh, worked a lot on the sloth bear assessment, red list assessment and reassessment of the sloth bear red list assessment for, for the world. And we are very happy here that Harendra is here for us. So Harendra, I uh, will not take much time of the listener and I would request you to start your talk. Welcome Harendra, welcome. Okay. Hello everyone. I am Dr. Haren Singh Bargali. I have been working with the field of conservation of nature and wildlife for the last more than 20 years. Currently, I have been working with the Corbett Foundation and I am, I am also interested with the responsibility of co-chair of IUCN SSC Stockbear expert team. Today, I am happy to join you all on the occasion of International Bear Day being celebrated by European Association for Zoos and Aquaria and other partners. I would like to explore this uh, opportunity by sharing uh, a few facts related with the ecology and conservation of sloth bear in India and, and its range countries. Worldwide, there are eight species of bears. Out of those eight species, four species occur in India. These species are sloth bear, Himalayan brown bear, Asiatic black bear, and Malayan sun bear. Sloth bear is a medium-sized bear species, and it can be recognized easily by looking at its saggy black coat with U or V-shaped chest mark. The animal can have height up to 90 centimeters and its body length can measure up to 1.9 meters. Male can weight up to 145 kg, whereas female weight can vary from 60 to 100 kg. So as far as distribution of sloth bears is concerned, they are endemic, endemic, endemic to Indian subcontinent. They are having their distribution in India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, but unfortunately in other countries where it used to have its distribution in Indian subcontinent, situation is not that good. The species has recently extirpated from Bangladesh, and they are extremely rare in Bhutan. As far as Indian scenario is concerned, they are widely distributed from southern tip of Western Ghats to the Himalayan foothills. And sloth bears are reported from 19 states. Sloth bears are basically a lowland species. However, they have been recorded in higher elevations as well. In North India, in Uttarakhand, they share their distribution range with the Himal Asiatic black bear distribution range. Whereas in Northeast India, they share their distribution range or, or their distribution range overlap with the distribution range of sun bear and Asiatic black bear. Sloth bears are mostly nocturnal. They remain active during evening and morning hours. However, 
in areas where is where there is least human disturbance or no such type of disturbance by grazing and other su such activities they can be seen active during day hours all as well however mostly they are nocturnal males have larger home range in comparison to females though there have been a few studies only but female home range has been estimated from 8 square kilometer to 15 square kilometer area only whereas in case of males in one of the studies it was about 24 square kilometer area and in some other study it was more than 50 square kilometer area they are opportunistic omnivore and their diet vary seasonally and geographically depending on the availability of food resources their diet includes insect honey fruits available in forest agricultural crops and fruits in orchards and sloth bears are the only species of bears having a special morphological adaptation to feed on insects and these adaptations are known as marmicophagy and these adaptations include absence of two upper incisors an elongated concave palate well developed lips flanges on the nose long front claws a long saggy coat and a nearly naked snout females attain matu maturity at about 3 years of age whereas in case of males they at attain maturity at the age of 4 years gestation period extends from 6 to 7 months breeding takes place during may to july and birth takes place during march to january after a period of delayed implantation litter size of two is more common whereas litter size of one has already also been recorded and litter size of three is very rare after giving birth female remain in partial or complete seclusion for a period of 3 to 6 weeks and cubs are born blind and they remain blind for next 3 4 weeks mothers carry young ones on their back for about 6 to 9 months and mothers stay with their mother for about 1 and a half year to 2 and a half year and this is also a sort of adaptation or it ensures defense against large bears or other predators as far as conservation challenges are concerned i have included all the challenges in three broad categories one is decline in number and distribution second is habitat loss and degradation and third one is human sloth bear conflicts as far as decline in number and distribution is concerned as much as mentioned earlier there have been a few studies on sloth bears or few detailed studies on sloth bears that's why only a few reliable estimates on sloth bear density and population numbers are available a population of 9000 to 30000 sloth bears has been estimated in india and total world population has been estimated as 10000 to 25000 however these estimates are very old i would say of more than 10 to 15 years old so considering all these lacunas all these shortcomings there is complete lack of systematic efforts to estimate and monitor bear population in wild second issue was habitat loss and degradation all sloth bear range countries are developing countries and sustaining very high human populations 
so in such a scenario there is tremendous pressure on available natural resources to meet the demands of human populations and that is leading to removal of habitat and degradation of available habitats and in such a scenario poaching for trade in body parts and especially for gallbladder is also going on because significant population of sloth bear exists outside the protected area there is threat to such population because inside the protected areas they are having uh, well they are well protected but outside considering the concept of protected areas and outside reserve forest there the population is under threat and wherever such populations are thriving in human dominated landscapes so <clears throat> this uh, sloth bear habitat has gone under a degradation because of tension of agricultural crop fields and townships infrastructure development projects and in some parts of their range stone quarrying is also going on so all these activities are leading to degradation of available habitats this picture shows a typical sloth bear habitat from the top of a den site or top of a hillock where you can see a typical sloth bear habitat in central india there is a, a village pond there village is there after that and if you look at extreme end again there is a hillock of boulders and this hillock also contains a number of active sloth bear den sites the other issue in sloth bear conservation that i highlighted was human sloth bear conflicts sloth bears are considered as the most dangerous wild animal across their distribution range because of habitat degradation and loss of habitat in their distribution range they are forced to share common food resources with human beings sloth bears raid agricultural fields for crops such as maize groundnut potatoes sweet potato potatoes etc and also raid orchards for mulberry guava mango and other fruiting species so since there are just a few studies so the moment we are having new studies we are getting new information about the new species being raided by the uh, bear and both in case of crop fields and also in orchards and on the other hand sloth bear feeding items such as tendu fruit mahua and other fruits which are used by sloth bears in their diet are also being collected by local communities as ntfp so on one hand bears are facing the problem of having scarcity of feeding resources in within the forest areas they are raiding the agricultural crop fields on the other hand local communities collect the feeding items which are from the forest areas which are used by bears in their diet all this is leading to increasing human sloth bear conflicts and which has negative consequences eventually and these consequences are in terms of retaliatory killings and degradation of habitat and destruction of their den sites by locals these are some of the pictures showing severity of human bear conflict if people are suffering like this or facing the casualties like this so in such a scenario it becomes very difficult to seek the cooperation of local communities for conservation so if we have to ensure sloth bear conservation then there is a need to take some measures to mitigate the conflict and by taking local communities in confidence uh here we can see in this picture this picture shows the forced use of habitat by bears this picture was taken from one of the corners of a village in the background you can see that there is a hillock of boulders with so many active sloth bear den sites if there are fruiting trees within the village then sloth bears raid all those fruiting trees and 
agricultural crops. On the contrary, local villagers, they go inside the forest for the cattle grazing and for the collection of NTFP. So in that way, uh, it clearly shows that it's the forced use of habitat where there are circumstances that the uh, incidents of human frog bear conflicts can be quite frequently. So what are the measures? What are the measures taken up by the authorities so far? Sloth bears are included in Schedule 1 of the Indian Wildlife Protection Act. They are listed as vulnerable in IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. And they are also listed in Appendix 1 of the CITES. And in India, an effort was made to focus on sloth bear conservation by launching a National Bear Conservation and Rehabilitation Action Plan in 2012. But after that, there were, there were no serious efforts in sloth bear conservation and it is going on at it used to be earlier. At the moment, most of the efforts are focused on flagship species. And these species are tigers, leopards, elephants, rhinos. So tigers, elephant and rhino, they are garnering most of the support from, both from the government and both from the donor and also from the donor agencies. So there is a need to focus on species specific conservation initiatives because each species is having its own requirement, its own uh, requirement of habitat and also about the feeding habitat and for the other ecological requirements. So adopt ecosystem approach of biodiversity management. So this is this can be done by influencing the people at policy level. So this can be done by considering bears among priority species for conservation. As I mentioned, bears are not among the priority species for conservation. And if they are not among the priority species for conservation, that means there are hardly any funds available to do any field interventions or to collect information on existing bear population in the wild. And if ecosystem approach of biodiversity management was adopted, that will or that can also help in by providing financial support to conduct field research. If such support is available, then there could be information on the status and management of both the species and its habitat. If there is no information available at all, if there are no uh, financial resources. So if so in that case, it becomes a bit difficult to gather information from the field or from the from sloth bear habitats. So whatever the information we are having today is only because of human sloth bear conflict. Though a number to mitigate the conflict and to ensure sloth bear conservation in the country, but all these efforts are in isolation or I would say in bits and pieces. Uh, Forbid Foundation has done some efforts in Central India. There are efforts in Gujarat. There are efforts in Maharashtra by some other uh, civil society organizations and government agencies. But there is a need to have sincere and concerted efforts to ensure slog bear conservation. Uh, we have made all these informative material both in Hindi and English. And we have also tried to highlight the issue of sloth bear conservation by writing popular articles in magazines and other such forums. So these all these efforts are other than uh, publishing the pub, uh, research papers so that uh, we have to work at policy level and we have to work at local level. So then only there, if there is synchronization in activities and if all such measures are there, then only we can be successful in ensuring stock bear conservation in India. At the last, considering the COVID-19 pandemic, I would request all of you to follow advisories issued by the authorities. Stay at home and stay safe. Thank you.
thank you so much harendra it was so nice to have you over here and uh, on behalf of all the partners and all the listener i thank you very much for giving your time to be live over here and to give a very nice and informative talk on the sloth bear friends as harendra rightly said that sloth bear are the bears of india bharat ke bhalu and we also have a message from millennium star amitabh bachchan and he also requested us to conserve and coexist with this sloth bear so today we had a two talk and we are ending our celebration today over here tomorrow we are again we are back with another expert talk on asiatic black bear by dr satya kumar dr satya kumar is a senior professor and scientist g in wildlife institute of india and one of the oldest researcher senior most researcher who is who has done his lot of research on asiatic black bear so tomorrow same time 5 o'clock over here on the youtube channel with wcb research lab corbett foundation century asia and vadodara wildlife division we'll meet again over here with dr satya kumar and we'll learn and he'll talk about asiatic black bear thank you so much all of you thank you dev and harendra thank you all of you all the listeners thank you thank you and wish you all a very happy bear day